Hello there, Atheist Jr. here, your friend and humble narrator. And I was looking at um, the Wacken Atheist from this previous week, and it was Simon Dan put out a challenge to Kent Hoven, really to all creationists, but it was to Kent specifically. And it was talking about different dating techniques, um, like uh, potassium argon dating. And I, I was looking at that video and I try to do the Whack and Atheist stream each week, but I found that Kent had done a video just like the day before about carbon dating. And I found I really had a lot more to say about that video. So this stream is going to sort of count as that Whack and Atheist stream because there's not a lot of difference. He, he doesn't even address Simon Dan's questions. Of course, of course not. But really quickly, I just want to draw. Uh, um, well, you know what? I'll 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 show you guys uh, it later. So yeah, let's get started. The lower leg of a mammoth, carbon dated fifteen thousand years old, but the skin and flesh were twenty one thousand. Okay, so this is a lie, <laughs> right off the bat. Um, I, I didn't show a bunch of the stuff Kent talked about at the beginning, but real quick, uh, let's talk about what is carbon dating and how does it work. So radiometric dating at its most basic level, we know some atoms are unstable, meaning that they'll decay into other atoms, like uranium into lead. Now, radioactive elements, they're unstable by nature, so they want to become more stable. So you can imagine lead is a lot more stable and like easier to handle than like uranium would be obviously you know uh, we can calculate how often an atom decays so by looking at the amount of parent and daughter isotopes the ratio we can calculate the age now carbon dating was discovered by willard libby it's based on the fact that radiocarbon is constantly being created in the earth's atmosphere by the interaction of cosmic rays with atmospheric nitrogen the resulting C14 combines with atmospheric oxygen to, to form radioactive carbon dioxide, which is incorporated into plants by photosynthesis. Animals then acquire the C14 by eating the plants. When the animal or plant dies, it stops exchanging carbon with its environment, and thereafter the amount of C14 it contains begins to decrease as the C14 undergoes radioactive decay. Measuring the amount of C14 in a sample from a dead plant or animal, such as a piece of wood or a fragment of bone, provides information that can be used to calculate when the animal or plant died. So we only use carbon dating on formerly living samples, animals or plants. We never use it on something that's alive. <laughs> okay? And we don't use it on rocks. So I can't believe that Kent Hoven is still showing this slide. Genuinely. Um, it's been explained to him directly by Bill Ludlow in their debate, but if we look at the actual paper that this came from, it's called Quaternary Stratigraphic Nomenclature in Unglaciated Central Alaska. We can see that although Hoven is presenting this as though one mammoth gave two dates for its leg and skin, you see the lower leg here and the skin and flesh. Um, it's actually two different mammoths because this mammoth was dated in 1940. This one was 1948. So check the dates, 15380 and 21300, okay? 15380 and 21300, the lower leg of the Fairbanks Creek mammoth, as in one mammoth. So he's presenting this like it's one mammoth that gave two different dates. But if you look at the actual paper that this came from, it was not the same mammoth, okay? It was two different mammoths because this one was found eight years later or dated eight years later. But Kent is still showing this slide after it's been explained to him multiple times. Well, now that was back in 1949 when they first invented the method. Maybe they got better. Let's see. Did it get any better? 15,000 year difference appeared in assessment of samples from a single single block of peat, peat moss. They mine it and dig it for a variety of things, okay? Well, that was 1978. Okay, so 
Let's read the abstract from the actual paper that this slide references. So it says that peat samples, so already multiple samples, not one sample, before, before radiocarbon assay were subjected to seven, seven different chemical treatments, which included extractions, the results obtained show considerable improvement, improvement in the reliability of C14 dates. The maximum improvement ranges from 500 years in the untreated peat to 15,000 years in the untreated buried peat. So again, this is two different samples. And this paper is talking about using different chemical treatments on peat samples before they were radiocarbon dated and then seeing the difference. Okay, so this, again, seems pretty dishonest to me. But what do you think? Chat, you can tell me what you think. <laughs> 15,000 year difference, huh? Living mollusk shells, carbon dated at 2,300 years old. They're still alive. Okay, so once again, let's look at the actual article. Do you guys know what it's titled? Radiocarbon dating, fictitious results with mollusk shells. Yeah, so this is not supposed to be showing how accurate carbon dating can be. It's showing how it doesn't work on certain things like mollusks because they live underwater. So the abstract says, evidence is presented to show that modern mollusk shells from rivers can have anomalous radiocarbon ages owing mainly to incorporation of inactive carbon from humus. Um, Humus is dark organic material that forms in soil when plant and animal matter decays. That means that it decays or breaks down into its most basic chemical elements. Many of these chemicals are important nutrients for the soil and organisms that depend on soil for life, such as plants. So it says, uh, from hummus, probably through the food web, as well as by the pathway of carbon dioxide from hummus decay. The resultant effect, in addition to the variable contributions of atmospheric carbon dioxide, fermentative <clears throat> CO2 from bottom muds, and locally of carbonate uh, carbon from dissolving limestones, makes the initial C14 activity of ancient freshwater shells indeterminate but within limits. Consequent errors of shell radiocarbon dates may be as large as several thousand years for river shells. So we know that it doesn't work on mollusks, mollusk shells or any sea breathing creature because they don't get their C14 from the air. Also, you would never use carbon-14 on a living creature. Kent should know this by now, but he still uses the same slide. <laughs> and they're 23. Oh, and we have a uh, super chat from Dave Dalapur. It says, what about carbon dating a live seal? Well, we'll get there. We will get there years old. So it didn't work on that. If a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it doesn't entirely contradict them, we put in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. How do you know which dates to drop? Okay, um, so I'm going to read to you the quote in, in its full context. It says, C14 dating was being discussed at a symposium on the prehistory of the Nile Valley. A famous American colleague, Professor Brew, briefly summarized a common attitude among archaeologists towards it as follows. If a C-14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it is completely out of date, we drop it. Few archaeologists who have concerned themselves with absolute chronology are innocent of sometimes having applied this method. So this quote was actually talking about archaeologists dating objects found near the Nile Valley in Egypt. So when it mentions our theories, it's talking about archaeologists working to find ancient Egyptian artifacts, not evolutionary theory. So it makes sense that if they found an artifact and it's dated to be way older than we know the Egyptian civilization was, they would know something had gone wrong, like contamination, and you throw the date out. Because we know how old the ancient Egyptian civilization was. So again, this seems pretty dishonest to me. What do you think? <laughs> Doesn't match the geologic column. Ah, freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1300 years old. Well, that's 1971, maybe they're- 
Okay, I'm going to let Bill Ludlow take this one. We're getting better here. A freshly killed seal was carbon dating and, and died 1,300 years ago. What can be dated? Samples must be younger than 50,000 years and older than 100 years. Did you know that? Yes, sir. Did you know that? Why? Well, why would you use a freshly killed seal and a live animal as evidence that the death doesn't work? That when the animal dies, Ken, it, it starts to deteriorate, carbon-14 to carbon-12. We can't, there's no way you could get a, a, an accurate method, a, a measurement from a live animal. No way. Well, if you don't understand that, you shouldn't even be talking about it. Right well, there. That one, X. That one, X. If, you, if, if modern humans were carbon if you and I were carbon dated, would we give the same carbon date? You show us how it worked for a living because because we aren't dead yet. We're still in equilibrium with the environment. Okay, then we should give you the same date. Oh, you do. Yeah, wake up. We, we, we should give the same date. We're both in the same environment. But we won't. This thing can't give until you've been dead for at least 100 years, Ken. It doesn't work on anything. It works on things that have been 100 years old, dead, 100 years dead, and 50,000 years dead. The troubles of radio. Uh, sorry about the audio on that. It's a really old video. Carbon dating are undeniably deep and serious. Despite 35 years of improving, okay, the assumptions are the same. They allow for contamination here, fractionization, fractionation there, and calibration whenever possible. It should be no surprise that fully half the dates are rejected. You get a date with carbon dating, it doesn't match what they want here. Try it again. Keep testing until you get this number. Hmm. Let's see. There are gross discrepancies. The chronology is uneven, and the accepted ages are actually dates are selected dates. Which one are we going to select? Well, that was in 1981. Let's see. Shells from living snails, 27,000 years old. Well, okay, so the apparent age of 27,000 years for, for these snails is another example of the reservoir effect. The springs from which the snails came were fed by carbonate aquifers. As this water percolated through the carbonates, it dissolved limestone and dolomite hundreds of millions of years old. So the dissolution of these, these rocks introduced con considerable quantities of dead carbon into the groundwater. And as a result, this groundwater, which fed into the spring which the snails lived, was significantly deficit in carbon-14 relative to what's found in the atmosphere. And again, we never carbon date living organisms. 1984. So they're going to say, see, that just proves it doesn't work on shells. That's all. Well, maybe so. 11 human skeletons, the earliest known human remains in the Western Hemisphere, have been dated by accelerator mass spectrometer. Ooh. All 11 were dated about 5,000 radiocarbon years or less. Um, I don't really understand what his point is here. Um, so what? Is this supposed to be evidence that the Earth is like 6,000 years old? And what, how do you, how do we know that these are the earliest known human remains? Are they talking about Homo sapiens? Are they talking about Homo erectus? I, I couldn't find the source to this on Google, so, yeah. Okay, we have another super chat from Dave Dalatior. It says, uh, and, and all this fit into a point on the page. Okay, you wanted to fit all of the living snails, all of the all of the, the seals that I clubbed into a dot smaller than a point on the page? Are you are you dumb in any other area? Are you stupid? Are you are you, you're stupid. You're stupid. You're the stupidest person I've ever met. Hold on. What if 1985? Hmm. How can these earliest humans be less than 5,000 years? How can these earliest hovens be less than 6 million years, Hoven? Radiocarbon is not quite as straightforward as it may seem. The technique does not, in fact, provide true ages, and radiocarbon results must be adjusted or calibrated to bring them into line with calendar ages. Okay, so radiocarbon dating measurements produce ages in radiocarbon years, which must be, like he said, converted to calendar ages by a process called calibration. Calibration is needed because the atmospheric C14 to C12 ratio, which is a key element in calculating radiocarbon ages, has not been constant historically. 
discrepancies began to be noted between measured ages and known historical dates for artifacts, and it became clear that a correction would need to be applied to radiocarbon ages to obtain calendar dates. Uncalibrated dates may be stated as radiocarbon years ago, or RCA. So I believe this is just to make these carbon dates easier to understand on our own human timescales. It doesn't mean anything about the theory not being accurate. Really, from the British Museum. Two Colorado Creek mammoths were dated at 22,000 and 16,000. Which one are you going to publish? No, no, you think that you think everything was compressed into a dot, but the dot was smaller than a period on a page, smaller than a proton, sm smaller than Eric Coven's brain. Coven? Small brain? Coven? Two mammoths, same strata, mm, 1992. Okay, so these Colorado Creek mammoths, um, I'm going to read the abstract here. It says the Colorado Creek Mammoth locality in west central Alaska contains the remains of two mammoths that were scavenged by carnivores. Interpretations of the re reworked eolian deposit surrounding the bones, supplemented by 10 radiocarbon dates, indicate that the lower and upper mammoths died and were buried with, within separate but superimposed thaw gullies about 2,300 and 16,000, 23,000 and 16,000 years ago, respectively. So you can see here that the two mammoths were not in the same uh, strata. They were, they were found in different areas. So they could have, they, they obviously lived uh, very different during different times. So that's probably why we got different ages. I don't think it's because of a flaw in the dating method. Is it getting any better? A geologist at Berserkley, uh, Swisher, used the most advanced techniques to date human fossils. Last spring, he reevaluated Homo erectus skulls found in Java by testing the sediment found with them. Uh -huh. Homo hovindus? Homo hovindus? Homo? Ho hovindus erectus? Dominant species assumed to be ancestor of Homo sapien, erectus is thought to have vanished 250,000 years ago. But even though he used two different dating methods, he kept making the same find. The bones were 53,000 at most, and possibly no more than 27,000. Hold it. Okay, so I found a quote about this. It says, Recent evidence of Homo erectus fossils found by geologist Carl Swisher suggests that human evolution did not proceed along the path of the commonly accepted model, which holds that Homo erectus gave rise to Homo sapiens and then went extinct. The skulls that Swisher found indicate a much later decline of the Homo erectus, and Swisher confirmed the age of the skulls with more than one dating method. However, the new conclusion has been difficult for many anthropologists to accept. The opposition questions whether Swisher has the correct bones, and also questions the accuracy of his techniques, preferring to cling to the old model of human evolution. Okay, so this is one person's hypothesis from the 90s. This is a really old source. And if he made a mistake here, that again, that doesn't invalidate carbon dating as a method. And considering that we haven't heard about this hypothesis since the 90s, I would think that it never caught on because it probably wasn't true. So you need to update your sources, Kent. Oh, but truth doesn't change, does it? Two plus two equals five uh, 100 years ago, and two plus two will equal Hoven 100 years from now. Oh, but he's hoping for 250,000. What happened here? That's 1996. Well, that's a 96% error, guys. Professor Reiner Proch von Zeiten lied. Professor Reiner Proch von Hovind. Now, okay, now hold on. You, okay, you don't get it, okay? These bones never appeared in a court of law, okay? In an honest court of law, if, if such one exists, not like the one where I got uh, convicted of 45 counts of structuring, Okay, they would laugh these boners out of court, okay? If you presented your bone in court, okay, the judge would take one look at it and he would say, put that bone away and get out of my courtroom, okay? Evolution false. About the age of Neanderthal, Neanderthal skulls for 30 years. They exposed his lie and he resigned in 2005. 
Uh, he said the skeleton was 21,000 years old, but testing at Oxford showed it to be 3,300 years old. World Net Daily. Hmm. Another dating error identified for a skull, crotch dated 20, 27,000. It was believed to be the oldest human remain found in the region until Oxford investigations indicated it belonged to a man, elderly man who died in 1750. Again, if this guy lied, that doesn't mean that carbon dating is not accurate, Kent. You're not a scientist. The people who do carbon dating know more than you do, okay? So get out of here with your sources that are from before I was born. Hold it. Why is he saying 27,000? This is a website. I don't know anything about Nephi code, who they are, but this was good information they had here. Nephi? Like Nephilim? Yeah, this is a... Uh a creationist website. I think it's Mormon. So not exactly the most scientifically accurate place to get your information about carbon dating from. Often. One last time. Radiocarbon dating is inaccurate. Since ages estimated by radiocarbon dates are used by evolutionists, archaeologists, paleontologists, paleobiologists, etc., to prove their theories about the past, specifically the antiquity of things, it's important we understand the errors involved in such dating. To be fair, what typically is reported by honest scientists winds up in scientific journals is the estimated ages with a margin of error. However, what makes it into the press, into the school textbooks, and the public conscience suddenly becomes accurate. They don't have to get quite as detailed to go into the public school textbooks. I've got a rack of them back there. Go take a look. Oh, uh, Hovind loves his racks. Radiocarbon dating has some very serious drawbacks and problems that are not typically known to the general public and rarely, if ever, taught at grade school level and not even in colleges as a rule, but rather as they're taught as absolutes. It's just not true. Science is a process where we zero in on, the, on what's more and more accurate. We, we don't pick one answer and say, okay, this is the absolute truth we figured it out. This is going to be taught as absolute and it will never change. That sounds a lot more like the Bible to me than science. Alvin? Shown below are, below are some of the errors or fallacies and assumptions and outright guesses that exist. We need to understand carbon-14 calibrations are based on seven assumptions concerning the past 20 to 30,000 years. These assumptions are both impossible to know and therefore impossible to measure. How tall was the candle? I don't know. Has it always burned at the same rate? I don't know. You can't measure I don't know. Measure that. The amount of C14 originally existing in the specimen at the time of its death is always the same. You can't know that. If the C14 in the atmosphere is fluctuating up and down, how much was in it when that animal died? You, you of course, carbon dating isn't perfect. But if it, if it was as flawed as Hovind says, then why would scientists even use it? Obviously, any flaws or assumptions that the method might have are going to be accounted for by these professionals. And saying that they can't know the initial content of C14 or that it's gone up and down, the level of C14 in the atmosphere has not varied appreciably over the last tens of thousands of years. Therefore, the initial C14 content is known for any reasonable sample. You can't know that. The balance between C14 production and decay has always been the same. They know that's not true. There's no way for anyone to know what amount of C14 existed 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, etc. You can't know that. Scientists must assume that the rate was changed and that no outside factors existed to change the assumption. The rate of carbon-14 decay is not altered. Is it always 5,730 year half-life? Since 8,000 years is almost two half-lives for C14, with its half-life being 5730 years, plus or minus, we have excellent observational evidence that the decay rate is constant. We also have laboratory studies which support the, co the constancy of all the decay rates used in radiometric dating. A great many experiments have, done, have been done in attempts to change radioactive decay rates, and these, exper these experiments have invariably failed to produce every, any significant changes. We've tried to change the decay rate of radioactive elements in the lab. We've never been able to do it. 
not once. So this is just a moot point. They know there's things that speed it up and slow it down. Oh, please share them, Kent. What are they? There's no way to know this. A scientist must assume no variation has taken place. Hmm. Let's see. Number four, organic material tested has not been contaminated by carbon-14 since its death. It laid there in the ground for thousands of years and never got contaminated. In the case of carbon-14 dating, the daughter product is ordinary nitrogen and plays no role in the dating process. We are only interested in tallying the original C14 still present in the sample, the surviving parent isotope. You know that. Okay. Yeah, we, we know that. Owen, we know that. Owen. Uh, none, of the, none of the C14 has entered or leaked out over thousands of years. Nobody can know that. Number five, Earth's magnetic field intensity has not changed. Because remember, the magnetic field blocks, filters out some of the UV light. So if the magnetic field is changing, and we know that changes all the time, the amount of C14 would be changing in the atmosphere. So you're trying to measure with a rubber ruler. How long is it? How long would you like it to be? That's what we got here, folks. So there is a great body of archaeological and geological data showing that the strength of the magnetic field has been fluctuating up and down for thousands of years, and that it has reversed polarity many times in the geological past. We know this because of the magnetic reversals that are recorded in the seafloor. That's why I would like to ask Kent, okay, Kent, so you're suggesting that the magnetic field intensity uh, hasn't changed? Well, or has changed? Because Kent will deny that you can see the polarity changes recorded in the seafloor. He'll say, oh, there are no magnetic reversals. Over. Um, and again, scientists are aware of this. They account for these things. And one of the things that Kent is not mentioning here is that we can cross-confirm these radiocarbon dates with other methods, one of the biggest being dendrochronology or tree ring dating. Tree ring dating. So we can cross-confirm these dates with other methods. So if you have two methods that are done in completely different ways and they return similar dates, that's pretty good evidence that the dates are correct. Uh, number six, there have been only very small variations in ocean depths. You gotta uh, assume that. While the scientists assume this has never happened, obviously it ignores the scriptural reference to the great flood of Noah's time, because that would greatly affect C-14. Oh, come on. Are you serious? Such a flood would render- You're not, you're not taking into account uh, the possibility of a global flood. Well, you're assuming that that happened. How is that not an assumption? It's like, oh, well, you haven't taken into account that uh, a, a wizard might have changed the C-14 amount. You know, have you accounted for warlocks? Have you accounted for elves and trolls? Have you accounted for dragons? I don't think that you have. Hoven, dragon, Hoven riding a dragon. For carbon dating of all specimens existing before that time, undateable. Ocean temperature changes have only been minor. They have to assume that. Cosmic ray intensity has the, the water changes temperature when I pee in it. Hover. Not changed. You don't know that. The sun is going through cycles. Is it putting out more C14 or putting out more cosmic radiation some days than others? Yes. There's no way that such knowledge could be known. Scientists must make two more assumptions that have not, that these have not changed in order to date the specimen. Just on this information alone, all specimen dating must require the scientists conducting such measurement to make eight assumptions on matters stretching back thousands of years where there can be absolutely no knowledge, no recorded information, no known baseline me measurement baseline. Okay, well, I could say the same thing about you predicting that there's a giant ice canopy around the Earth. You couldn't have known all of the conditions thousands of years ago. So how is it that you have any evidence that there was a frickin' ice canopy that surrounded the entire Earth. Open. Yet the scientists still claim radioactive carbon is accurate within a plus or minus date. Well, if all those assumptions are true, then yes, your date is right. But any one of those assumptions would mess it up. 
Now they've got some real fancy equipment to do the carbon dating with. Megabucks put into this stuff. The equipment to measure the number of, of atoms they are decaying is much better than 80 years ago, or even perfect. They might even have, might measure it perfectly. I'll give them perfection. That doesn't change the assumptions under it. You can measure the candle precisely 7.0439 inches tall. When was it lit? Do you see? One part of a mammoth is 29,000 years old, another part is 44,000. Okay, he skipped past that slide real fast, but uh, that uh, stuff about the mammoth, that was referencing the same paper that I showed you guys earlier. And I looked in that paper and I found nothing of the sort listed on that slide. Nothing about a Vol Volosovich mammoth. No, I didn't find either one of those dates on there. So I'm just going to say that Hoven made this up because he's a liar. I mean, I think it's reasonable for me to assume that. In the last two years, an absolute date was obtained for the Gandong beds above the Trenel beds. It has the interesting A value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. Boy, I get bang that right on the head. Let's see. Was that English? Yeah, I, I couldn't find this, uh, the source for this information anywhere on Google, so I'm just going to say that Hoven made it up and move on. Uh, geological survey. Or just repeated it from another creationist who made it up or sourced it wrong. A professional paper 862. They said in here, let's see, uh, 17,000 years for frozen silt. I could be wrong about the, the last mammoth slide. I couldn't find any information about mammoths using those dates. And he said it was on page 30, but I didn't see anything on there with those dates. Rich in organic material, 26,000 years. For frozen silt, rich in organic material. This one taken from the muscle. Yeah, the frozen silt, that's not the source that's being, that's not the thing that's being carbon dated. That's the stratigraphic area that it was found. From the scalp of a mammoth, I believe, or a ovio boss. What is that one? How are we even supposed to be able to read this stuff? Like, his video quality is so bad that <laughs> you can barely even check his sources or read what he's trying to show. I don't even know what his point is supposed to be here. Bison, uh, Arctic bison. 20,000 years, university. So is it 20,000 or 28,000? They get numbers all the time. This is the same sample as 299. See that? One guy got less than 20,000, another guy got more than 28,000. Yeah, carbon dates are going to vary for a lot of different reasons. But again, scientists can cross-confirm the dates to narrow down and bracket the, the carbon dates and find which is the most accurate one. This isn't new information that only you creationists are privy to. Okay, scientists can account for this stuff. And it's common to sometimes date things up to 10 times, like I showed earlier. And then you see which dates are the most common. So you're narrowing down to the most correct answer. That's what the scientific method is all about, Kent, Hovind. Which one are you going to pick? Ah, same sample. Answers to creationist attacks on carbon-14. This is from Jeannie Scott. Jeannie, I'll debate you any time. Remember when I walked through your place out there, Jeannie, in Berserkley? Yeah, I'll come back. And you guys came to hear me speak at Berserkley University there. Jeannie Scott is not even the leader of NCSE anymore, Kent. They've been doing this for 40 years. National Center for Science Miseducation. Answers to creationist attacks on carbon-14. Downloaded this today. Keith and Anderson radiocarbon dated the shell of a living freshwater mussel and obtained an age of over 2,000 years. They're still alive. ICR science creationists claim this discredits carbon-14. How do you reply? Jeannie or somebody working there said, it does discredit C14 dating of freshwater mussels, but that's all. Did you have a point? Keith and Anderson show considerable evidence that the mussel. I like how he mugs at the camera like this is such a slam dunk. It's like, yeah, we already know. Mussel acquired much of their carbon from the limestone in the waters they lived in. Oh. 
and the waters that the Hovens lived in. Hoven. And some from very old humus as well. Thus, a freshly killed mussel has far less C14 than a freshly killed something else. What? So you, this is an example of contamination. You can't know those things. Question. Creationists like Cook claim that cosmic radiation is now forming C14 in the atmosphere one and a third times faster than it's decaying. If we extrapolate backwards with, in time with the proper uh, equations, we find that the earliest, is, earlier the historical period, the less C14 the atmosphere had. If we extrapolate as far back as 10,000 years ago, we find the atmosphere did not have any C14 at all. If they are right, all C14 ages greater than two or 3,000 years need to be lowered drastically. And that the Earth can be no older than 10,000. How do you reply? They said at Berserkley, uh, I mean, at National Center for Science Miseducation, yes, Cook is right. C14 is forming today faster than it's decaying. However, the amount of C14 has not been rising steadily as Cook maintains. It has fluctuated up and down over the past 10,000 years. Well, then how do you know to date things? You have a rubber ruler. Live so Kent left out the rest of the reply. It says, there are two ways of dating wood from bristlecone pines. One can count rings or one can radiocarbon date the wood. Since the tree ring counts have been reliably dated, some specimens of wood all the way back to 6200 BC one can check out the C14 dates against the tree ring count dates. Admittedly, this old wood comes from trees that have been dead for hundreds of years, but you don't have to have an 8,200-year-old bristlecone pine tree alive today to validly determine that sort of date. It is easy to correlate the inner rings of a younger living tree with the outer rings of an older dead tree. When experts compare the tree ring dates with the C14 dates, they find that radiocarbon ages before 1000 BC are really too young, not too old, as Cook maintains. For example, pieces of wood that date to about 6200 BC by tree ring counts dated only 5400 BC by regular C14 dating, and 3900 BC by Cook's creationist revision of C14 dating. So, despite creationist claims, C14 before 3000 years ago was decaying faster than it was being formed and C14 dating errs on the side of making objects from before 1000 BC look too young, not too old. Penguins dated 8,000 years old. We don't date living things. Material from layers where dinosaur bones were found were carbon dated at 34,000. Wait a minute. We don't date dinosaurs with carbon dating. You're stupid. Over. I thought they were 70 million. Huh. Russian scientists dated dinosaur bones at under 30,000. We don't date dinosaurs with carbon dating. You're stupid. Over. 1,000 years. Guy in Columbus had four dinosaur bone samples, carbon dated at 20,000 years old. Oh, and uh, Reader's Digest? Nice source, Kent. We don't date dinosaur bones with carbon dating, you're stupid. Hold on. He did not tell them they were dinosaur bones in advance. When later he said, oh, this is from dinosaur. Oh, well, you should have told us that. We wouldn't have used carbon dating. We used a different method. Yeah, exactly. Because it's a waste of time. Hovind. Right. So if you right. date a sample of known age, it doesn't work. If you date a sample of unknown age, it's assumed, it's assumed to work. Elements decay, they produce helium. Helium slowly escapes through the rocks into the atmosphere. Very little is able to escape into space. After all factors are considered, the helium in the atmosphere indicates the Earth is less than 2 million years old. What does this have to do with carbon dating? There's a great book on carbon dating if you want a lot more. The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> do they even think about what they say? T-Rex turned into a chicken. Can't Hoven paid taxes. <laughs> Hoven. Everything fit in a dot. Do you stop and do you ever stop and just think about that? Stratigraphy <sighs> cannot avoid this kind of reasoning if it insists on using temporal concepts, because circularity is inherent. I did a whole stream uh, about these quote mines, so you can watch that. You have to use circular reasoning. Date the rocks by the fossils, date the fossils by the rocks. Moon rocks about, brought back in 1969 were given to many different laboratories. One specimen was divided into six pieces and dated many times. The ages range from 2.5 billion to 4.6 billion. Yeah, there's no source here, so I'm just going to say that Kent Hovind made this up and he's a liar. I'd say there's not real precision there, guys, okay? 
I talked to James Dawson uh, in 1999. I tried to call the number today. It's no longer working from 20 years ago. Why would you do that? Why would you think that it was going to work? <laughs> Why? That's so stupid. He was the chief of engineering and operations for the Lunar and Earth Science Division at Manned Spacecraft Center, NASA, in Houston. He worked on lunar samples, including the Genesis rock. He told me when I called him, they found ages from 10,000 years to several billion years in the same rock. Which one are you going to publish? Another okay, we have a, uh, another super chat from Dave Gallifier. It says, I, I, play, I pay plenty of taxes in my property taxes. All of, all of the property taxes go to the schools. Over Oh, um, speaking of that, Monday, Professor Dave will be on this channel, so look forward to that. I'll be interviewing Professor Dave. That'll be fun. Should be Monday afternoon. A great book on how carbon dating and radiometric dating is. We don't sell that one, do we? Oh, okay. So... That is the end of the video. I just, uh, I cut out the part where Kent is actually presenting his evidence. The rest of it is just Bible study crap that I don't care about. So I wanted to draw you guys' attention to the fact that one of my tweets went sort of viral. Look at that, 460 likes and 55 retweets. I'm sorry, I just had, I just had to brag about this because... Uh, I'm very, very proud of, of this tweet. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so. Like the video. Leave a comment below telling me what you thought of this stream. Um, remember to tune in on Monday. Also, Sunday, I'm going to be interviewing... Um, somebody who's a PhD candidate in, I believe, behavioral psychology. And we're going to talk about the uh, psychology of young earth creationism, of Kent Hovind, of, uh, you know, all that stuff. That's going to be interesting. So that's Sunday. I have it scheduled. Should be 5 p.m. And then Monday afternoon, Professor Dave, I'm going to be talking to him on this channel. So that should be very fun. So subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you would like to support this content past just engaging with it, you can go to patreon.com slash atheist junior and consider pledging as low as $1 per month. Although I have other tiers if you want to support more. But that will unlock exclusive videos, early videos, and some some behind the scenes stuff and memes that I like to post. We have fun. We have fun on the on the Patreon page. Um, but if you can't uh, if you can't support monetarily, I'm more than happy to have people just watching my content. I think it's awesome that you guys are, are, are watching and uh, enjoy the videos. It it's an honor for me, really. It, I wake up every day with renewed vigor to put out content for my audience because I think you guys are awesome. You know, I think, I know everybody says this, but I think I have one of the best uh, communities on YouTube. I think you guys are great. Very non-toxic community. You guys are like Play-Doh. I could eat you. Okay. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and uh, stick around for the next one um, on Monday. I hope to see you guys in the live chat. Thanks for watching.